Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the second lecture of the uh, mock lecture series of the RightWit Interreg North Voice program. I'm Marco Delvecchio from uh, TPSC, the Thermoplastics Complex Application Center. As we already seen, we focus into the uh, processing, automation and recycling of uh, thermoplastics and composite material that can be virgin but also recycled material. So, today we will go uh, through a different topic, that is the uh, composite materials. So, we will give first a definition of lightweight structure and composites, then we will focus on the classification and composition of those materials. So, we will give it the focus on the reinforcement and the metrics, on the composite manufacturing, so the processing of these kind of materials and eventually a laminate design. Uh, then we will give a focus to the mechanics of these materials and uh, a special uh, attention to the testing and the failure of mechanism of these kind of materials. So, first of all, uh, we will give a definition of lightweight structure. What are exactly lightweight structures? Yeah. First of all, we will give a definition of the lightweight structure. What are exactly uh, lightweight structures? Lightweight structures uh, can be defined uh, or can be termed uh, as such when, uh, regardless of the type of material employed, the shape of the structure is determined through an optimization process uh, to efficiently carry the loads from a critical loading use. Uh, again, how can we define lightweight structure then? Uh, a lightweight structure is a, a kind of material, is a kind of uh, optimized structure in which there is an intelligent use of materials. So there's a proper material selection according to the best ability to bear the forces, to withstand the forces, but also an intelligent combination of material properties and design. Uh, and then again, an optimization that can go through stru uh, structural topologies analysis. As we can see, for example, in the picture, we can see that a model can be optimized through different type of analysis and eventually a final uh, structure, optimized uh, structure, can be defined. So, uh, the uh, type of discipline that studies the lightweight materials is called lightweight engineering. When we think about our product uh, that can be uh, designed in lightweight engineering, uh, we uh, focus on three main aspects that can be the design, so defining a concept and analysis for the product uh, that, as I said before, can be an optimized analysis, a topology analysis, eventually uh, production and materials. Materials, uh, as we said, they can be lightweight, uh, so they have a low uh, density and in our case would be composite, for example, and production methods typical of those kind of materials that can be filament winding or tape placement, 3D printing or any kind of process that deal with composite materials. So, um, focusing on lightweight materials uh, and basically um, on lightweight structures, we can say that they are employed in many kind of applications and we can see them like everywhere in architecture, building engineering, uh, then construction, Type of uh, different type of engineering, so aerospace and automotive, uh, but uh, which is the main characteristics? Uh, basically, the cell weight of the structure is uh, a small uh, portion, a small part of the applied load uh, or the generated forces. Uh, so, lightweight structures utilize uh, lightweight and high strength materials, so really stiff materials, uh, as well as advanced technologies for the design and constructions. Um, typical other materials can be aluminium, magnesium, beryllium, but also engineering thermoplastics that for, for sure have different properties than the other that are metals, but also structural ceramics and uh, composites. Every of those has different kind of applications uh, and you want to use, for example, ceramic where uh, toughness is required, but you want to use uh, uh, composites where other kind of properties like stiffness uh, needs to be uh, in the final applications. Here in the table an overview of uh, some of the uh, lightweight material that we already mentioned, so the metals and the polymer matrix composites and uh, their properties. We can see for example um, that um, composite might have uh, lower, uh, polymer metric composite might have a lower uh, modulus of elasticity uh, in respect to titanium alloys, aluminum alloys, but still they have uh, other properties like for example flexibility or um, um, 
or higher um, uh, deformation uh, elongation. Uh, moving to composites, uh, that are the main uh, task of our lecture, uh, how can be defined? Uh, a composite material is a mix of two or more constituents with different uh, physical or chemical properties or even mechanical properties which remain separate and distinct at the macroscopic level uh, but within the final structure. So we can see in the picture here uh, that the composite is a mix of these two kind of uh, materials that the fiber uh, is called reinforcement or the matrix uh, that is uh, in composing a unique structure that is the composite material. Uh, as, again, as, as I said, there are two distinct phases in a composite uh, that have well-defined interfaces. One is a continuous phase and is the matrix, uh, which acts as a bander and as a support for the final uh, material, for the final composite, and a dispersed phase that is basically the reinforcement that is giving the strength and the stiffness to the final material, to the composite. We can see basically composites everywhere, uh, even in nature. Uh, wood uh, is a composite because it's composed of cellulose um, and lignin. Lignin acts as a thermoplastic matrix while cellulose fibers act as a reinforcement. So uh, they are giving the strength to the final composites. The same would be for the concrete. Uh, it's con it's a mix of uh, gravel, cement and sand, uh, they, they stay in a, unique, um, uh, in a unique material and also bones in our body. Uh, well, they are composed of uh, hydroxybatide and collagen. And again, the collagen would act as a matrix that is uh, basically protecting uh, the uh, hydroxybatide um, fibers that they have, I would say, a ceramic uh, behavior. Um, and that they act as a reinforcement for the final structure that is our bone. Uh, so, going more specifically to the classification and composition of the composite material, we will give first a focus to the reinforcement and matrix. So, um, fibers in general uh, have mechanical, high mechanical properties, so they are high stiffness, high strength, and also have a low density. Uh, the main uh, objective of the fibers is to bear, to withstand the uh, apply loads. Then the matrix has good shear properties but also low density, so uh, the main aim of the uh, matrix is to transfer external loads to fibers, uh, bonding the fibers, protect the fibers and prevents uh, them from degradation uh, and eventually to give also the uh, structural geometry of the fibers. Uh, the, um, the, the processing together of together of uh, together matrix and fiber reinforcement gives uh, the I will repeat this. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So as already anticipated, uh, composite material is a mixture of uh, fibers, so reinforcement uh, matrix that we can see, and uh, yes, a composite is the mix of the two of them. Um, fibers has a, a high stiffness, high strength, but also a low density, and their main function is to bear the applied loads. While uh, for the matrix, it has good shear properties, has a low density, and the main function is to uh, transfer external loads to the fibers, bonding of the fibers, uh, prevents them from degradation, and eventually to give the uh, structural geometry. So, uh, the composition of this, uh, these two uh, kind of materials with different properties uh, give a unique material with high stiffness, high strength, low density and good shear properties. So, um, the important thing is that the good bonding uh, between the fiber and the matrix is there, exists. And this is because the stress needs to be transferred from the matrix, from the, uh, matrix to the fibers that have to withstand all the loads. Um, then we give a classification of the composite materials. Uh, here uh, we can see an easy uh, classification of the composites as divided into particle reinforced composites, fiber reinforced composites and uh, structural composites. Uh, every, every of them uh, can be subdivided into at least two categories. So we can see for example 
particle uh, reinforced polymers that can be divided into large particle composites and uh, dispersion strengthened composites. Then uh, fiber reinforced composite that can be uh, continuous where basically the fibers are aligned and discontinuous where uh, the fibers are placed uh, randomly and they are mostly short fibers and in general they have lower mechanical properties than the continuous ones. Uh, eventually the discontinuous short fibers uh, reinforced composite can be subdivided into aligned and randomly oriented if the fibers of course are partially aligned or uh, randomly orientated and eventually structural composites they are a bit a mixed um, combination between the particle reinforced and the fiber reinforced so they have a really good um, structural geometry and they are uh, basically the laminates and the sandwich panels um, the composites uh, basically uh, they are named uh, according to the type uh, of fibers but also to the type of matrix so we can uh, recall them as a metal matrix composite when there is a metal matrix ceramic matrix composites so when for example properties like the toughness are required and basically uh, the matrix is a ceramic material and eventually polymer matrix composite that we will see more in the specific in the next section. But why composites? Uh, well, composites have many properties, they are used in many applications, as we can see, for example, in the picture, so in aerospace, uh, for bridge building, or even for building engineering, so uh, as a panel uh, structure, or in uh, wind energy applications, and eventually also as a medical application, when biomaterials or uh, uh, biocompatible materials are used. So why? Why are they important? Why uh, are they used? Basically, uh, there are uh, many um, uh, many uh, advantages, like for example the mass reduction, uh, they are really lightweight materials, so in this case are really um, uh, important. They have corrosion resistance and this means that they need less maintenance. They are durable materials, thanks to the metric that is protecting all the fibers, uh, so they have a less abrasive wear than the other materials. And uh, yeah, thanks to the different type of uh, fibers and the kind of material that you can use, uh, you have a lot of freedom in design, uh, both for elements and parts. Um, then they are important also because they can integrate easily the parts and functions. Uh, you can have different modular concepts and eventually uh, they are sustainable, they can be sustainable. So some of them is not that easy, they can be recycled, uh, but we will see this in the next uh, lectures. Now we will give a focus again on the reinforcement, so uh, we focus on the type of fibers and we will distinguish as natural fibers and synthetic fibers. So uh, natural fibers we will define according to the type of sources, so from where they come. So we can distinguish as animal fibers, plant fibers and mineral fibers. Animal fibers are for example silk, wool, camel. Plant fibers, well, they are really used right now in the automotive industry, uh, but also in any other applications and um, they are for example cotton, jute, uh, hemp coming from the bus, uh, or the flax, that is one of the most used, uh, but we can distinguish also other kind of natural uh, plant fibers coming from other uh, kind of plant like the leaf or the fruit, and that can be the sisal or the quar, and uh, mineral fibers eventually, uh, like the asbestos or the basalt fibers. Um, moving to the synthetic fibers, they can be um, subdivided into or in organic fibers and organic fibers. Inorganic fibers are the most typical and uh, they are used mostly in aerospace and automotive industry and they are uh, glass fiber, carbon fibers, boron fibers, alumina fibers and in general those kind of fibers have good, really good mechanical properties, really high if compared to the natural fibers or the other organic fibers but also good chemical and biological resistance. On the other side we have uh, organic fibers, uh, so basically the come also from the polymers and they are uh, polypropylene fibers or aramid fibers or uh, polyethylene fibers. Yeah. Uh, again, the reinforcement uh, phase provides uh, the strength and the stiffness of the composite uh, that 
can be usually a fiber or particulate. So when we call uh, when we see the fiber as a particulate, then we talk about particulate composites that tend to be a bit weaker and less stiff than the continuous fiber composites, and that's because uh, they are well, they are smaller than the, for example, than the fiber composite that they, they have longer fibers, uh, so the uh, they have higher properties. Uh, but this is why the fiber length uh, is greater than its diameter, so they have a higher aspect ratio. So the aspect ratio can be defined as the ratio between uh, the length of the fiber and the diameter of the fiber. So higher the aspect ratio, higher uh, also the properties, the final mechanical properties of the um, uh, final composite. Uh, and uh, as for those fiber composites, we can also give it another distinction that is between continuous and discontinuous fiber composites and uh, that can be unidirectional, uh, so basically the properties are really high on a direction, like it can be the longitudinal direction of the fibers, but not really on the transversal direction of the fibers. Then uh, a woven uh, classical cross ply or just a woven mat and uh, eventually like a rowing uh, continuous fiber composite uh, that is a filament wound um, composite. If the fibers are placed in a discontinuous wave, so in a random way, uh, we call it as a, a chopped fiber composite or chopped strand mat, CSM, or just a mat, as we can see in the uh, graph. As for properties, yes, we see carbon fibers, aramid fibers, e-glass fibers, if we compare those, we can see that the higher properties, so the stiffer materials, uh, are uh, those of the carbon fiber. Uh, because the young modulus that represent the stiffness of the material is the higher um, and uh, the E-glass are a bit lower in modulus and this kind of difference in properties will give also the difference in cost. In fact, for example, uh, glass fiber can be uh, really cheaper if compared to the carbon fibers. Then we move to the other kind of fiber, so the natural fibers. Uh, we uh, see from the graph uh, that the use of natural fiber it has been uh, already uh, employed in the industry uh, also already since 2012 and uh, if we can stay at the graph basically 50% of the composites are made in uh, flax uh, so it is a plant fibers uh, instead of well canna for hemp and the others is still uh, lack on the way but uh, still they are used right now uh, but why it's important to switch from uh, synthetic fibers to natural fibers? They can be indeed an alternative to glass fibers and other synthetic fibers. Uh, and uh, flags can have, yeah, they can be defined as a fiber from a uh, plant, but you can use also other fiber like animal fibers or mineral uh, fibers, so depending on the origin, on their source. Uh, but the most important thing is that they are environment, environmentally friendly. So basically the growth of plants results uh, in sequestration of CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, the natural plant cultivation can consume less energy than the production of synthetic polymers. Uh, basically uh, they have a less uh, environmental impact if compared to the synthetic ones. Uh, and they are basically produced from renewable uh, poly resources. Uh, so basically from a plant or minerals uh, and at the end of their life cycle they can be biodegradable so they can uh, just degrade uh, by uh, the action of other microorganisms or uh, well the weather for example uh, if we give a just a small um, comparison between uh, natural fibers and synthetic fibers uh, we can say that the main advantages of the natural fibers can be again their biodegradability, their low density, so also uh, price. But uh, since the processes are still quite new, uh, they're still in homogeneous quality and a lot of R&D has to be done to improve those. Uh, and they have a bit of uh, dimensional instability and this is, comes from the first one, so the processing methods. As for the synthetic fibers, um, due to their origin, they can be really moisture resistant, so uh, they are not uh, highly hygroscopic materials, and they have really good mechanical properties, as we've seen, for example, for the carbon fibers or the aramid fibers. 
The difference is uh, that they can be more difficult in recycling, but again, for this, there's another lecture that you can check, uh, but they are also relatively high in price. If we see the table uh, below, uh, we can have a small differences between the synthetic fibers and the natural fibers, and uh, what we discussed, or for example, the stiffness, the mechanical properties, uh, we can definitely say that the synthetic fibers have higher modulus than the uh, natural fibers, uh, but again, um, the um, properties like the density uh, can be a bit higher, so we can consider the natural fibers are more light with materials than the, the synthetic fibers. If we move to the matrix, uh, we already mentioned that we can have uh, metal uh, matrix composites or ceramic matrix composites and polymer matrix composites. This depends on the type of matrix, so the phase that is surrounding the fibers. Uh, this might be, again, a metal, a polymer or a ceramic. In general, metals and polymers are used when properties like ductilities are uh, desirable or uh, needs to be there in the final composite. Ceramics are used to improve fracture toughness, so it's completely different application than the previous ones. And a uh, typical function of the matrix are binding the fibers together uh, to give the final structure to the composite, acting as the medium by which an externally applied stress is transmitted and distributed to the fibers, protecting uh, the individual fibers from surface damage, so also from corrosion and any kind of fibers you wear, as a result again of mechanical uh, stresses or chemical reaction within the environment, and serving as a barrier to crack propagation. Uh, then again, adhesive bonding um, is quite important also to um, uh, minimize the, the, the fiber pull out, so the uh, movement of the fibers. Okay, going more specifically, we can now focus on the polymer metric uh, composites. Uh, so, uh, as we've seen already in the lecture one, we can distinguish the polymers as in thermoses, thermoplastics and rubbers, so the elastomers. I will go really quickly on this topic since uh, you can check the lecture one of the MOOC. Uh, basically, thermosets uh, are, for example, polyesters or uh, vinyl ester, epoxies, and they are distinguished for the thermoplastics um, due to their networks among the chains. Uh, thermoplastics can be divided into amorphous and semi-crystalline depending on the presence of semi-crystalline regions or not. Uh, amorphous can be like polycarbonate or polyserine, while semi-crystalline can be the polypropylene, the polyethylene, uh, and rubbers uh, are just elastomers and they are distinguished from the thermoses and thermoplastics because uh, they have also networks but uh, they have also high flexibility of the chains. Um, here again, just a small um, comparison between the three types of materials. Basically, thermoplastic polymer can be heated and molded over and over uh, because they have long, unconnected molecular chains with few or no crosslinks. Uh, they can ignite and burn when heated. And examples again can be styrofoam packing pins, polyserine plastics, plastic bottles like PET bottles. Um, while thermosets, uh, once formed, cannot be softened, uh, cannot be remelted, uh, because they have many crosslinks between the polymer chain that we called crosslink, and uh, they give it a rigid uh, structure. Uh, they can usually resist burning uh, till the degradation temperature is reached, but may exactly char at the high temperatures. Um, typical uh, examples are the epoxies, the polyesters, uh, the urethane and eventually the elastomers, that uh, they have polymeric chains with high degree of flexibility and mobility that they give the final elastic behavior. Um, so yeah, they are likely cross-link materials, if we compare for example the elastomers to the thermosets, we can see yeah, that they have less cross-link that are shown by the uh, straight line. Typical examples are just rubbers and polyurethanes. Then, um, after finishing the part of uh, reinforcement and matrix, so basically the first part of classification and composition, we can move to the processing, the manufacturing of composites. Um, basically, um, 
if uh, we see the uh, table, uh, the, the diagram on the right, uh, composite process uh, can be differentiated according uh, to their matrix. If they are thermosets or thermoplastics. Uh, and again, also uh, this uh, type of process can be uh, as a subdivision. For example, thermosets uh, composite process can be different if you have discontinuous fiber composite or if you have continuous fiber composites, and the same if it is for the thermoplastics if they are. Uh, the fibers are continuous or in a discontinuous way. So yeah, we can have different kind of methods like can be uh, spray layout for uh, discontinuous fiber composites with the thermoset matrix or that can be the pultrusion um, or the filament winding in the cases continuous fiber uh, composite with thermoset matrix and if you have a thermoplastic composite processes then the most typical are just compression molding or ejection molding um, but how do you choose the uh, manufacturing of those? Yeah, basically uh, these methods can be chose based on, on the suitability of uh, for single piece or serial production. So you want to choose the methods according to the how many pieces you wanna you wanna produce, you wanna manufacture according to the temperature. So which max temperature can be uh, withstand by the machine, or you can process the poly the, the polymer composite, the type of pressure the cure rate in the case of thermoset composites, the type of uh, quality, so which is the desired surface quality, the raw material, so again, if it's a thermoset or the thermoplastics, it's the discontinuous fiber or a continuous fiber, the quantity and type of required tools, and also the cost that can be uh, afforded by the, the industry. But for each product, for uh, each processing method in general, can be found a sort of an investment and optimization um, in the knowledge, tools and functionality. Uh, as for composite manufacturing, so during the design process and when selecting a processing method, uh, several types of reinforcement can be chosen. So um, it can be a bobbins with uh, fiber strands or yarns, woven fabrics, uh, MCF that stands for uh, non creep fabrics, and a mass with different combination or fiber orientation. Um, in addition uh, to the separate resin and fabric components, it's possible also to process uh, pre-impregnated materials that are called pre-pregs, uh, in which the resin is not per se uh, already um, consolidated, cured, so you need a final process to consolidate it. So the resin is pre-consolidated and you need a final process to consolidate it and to cure it. Uh, the most important uh, parameters to take into account when you process uh, composite material are two that are temperature and pressure. So uh, tuning, by tuning the pressure of a resin, uh, basically a composite that has not been uh, yet cured, um, you can uh, also lower uh, the probability of gas formation. Uh, and this is an example of the degasification by uh, lowering the pressure. And also the viscosity can be tuned. The viscosity is an important parameter for processing uh, this kind of materials. Um, and it's strictly dependent on the temperature. So uh, that would improve a better viscosity, a lower viscosity would improve the wettability of the fibers. That is important for the final properties of the material, of the composite, uh, and for the uh, stress transfer. Uh, here, just an example of the one of the processing method that we um, that we saw uh, basically uh, is a closed uh, the, the SFT or FT compression molding that stay for uh, short uh, fiber thermoplastics or long fiber thermoplastics uh, compression molding is just a process that can be used for uh, well both continuous or discontinuous fiber uh, thermoplastics uh, composites um, short fiber mostly when you have, of course, short fibers, you can just mix it in the like a low shear mixer or an extruder, and eventually a dough comes out that can be compression molding, and the final structure of the product uh, can be given. Well, if you want a low, uh, if you have as a starting material uh, long fiber thermoplastics that can be, for example, in a glass rowing, these go also through the process where they are mixed with the matrix, and again a final uh, compression molded product can be obtained. 
Which are advantages and disadvantages of this process? Well, uh, indeed it is uh, suitable for automation uh, because it can be a really fast process. So short cycle uh, times. Uh, you have a vast material of choice because you can use many kind of thermoplastics materials. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, also uh, relatively high uh, part complexity depending on the final mold. Disadvantages, well, uh, high equipment investment in cost, uh, so uh, it's not a cheap process uh, and the mechanical properties are average in the case you are using SFT, so short fiber uh, thermoplastics because um, of course they are placed in a random way, in a random way so the stress can go a bit anywhere. Moving to the flexural test, so uh, it's a test in which a freely supported sample is subjected to a flexural loading. Uh, it's important for the determination of the uh, flexural stress uh, strain response. Uh, bending modulus and bending strength are the most typical properties that are calculated by this kind of test. Uh, most important to know is also that the bending modulus represents the stiffness of the composite and uh, typical standard for uh, composite material is the N-ISO uh, 1425 that it calculates basically these properties according if it is a three-point bending or four-point bending. Basically, the difference between three-point bending and four-point bending is that in the three-point bending there are just two supports and then indenter and vice versa. In the uh, four-point bending, two supports and two indenters that are acting on the material. Uh, here, a typical uh, stress strain curve uh, of the composite material. Uh, why it's important to delineate this region that is a straight region? We have seen it also in the tensile testing, uh, but the most important is because that will be uh, the point in which we will calculate our elastic modulus. In fact, um, the uh, delta F over the delta S is basically the ratio uh, of uh, the force 2 and force 1 in the straight region. And S2 minus S1, that is the delta S, is exactly the elongation of the polymer in the point in which also the force is calculated. So basically, uh, the flexural stress and flexural modulus are, uh, depend are directly dependent on um, the span, that is the L, but also inversely dependent on the width and thickness, that are the B and the H that you can see in the formula. And therefore, the flexural stress basically is the maximum load that can be withstood uh, by the uh, composite. So, the force would be the highest one that will be reached in the force deformation curve. Then, um, there are other types of uh, testing that we can uh, consider as for the composites. We have seen the tensile testing and the flexural testing, but others can be the interlaminar shear test or the compression test. The shear testing, uh, also called the interlaminar shear strength uh, test, or ILSS, is a simple test performed using a small specimen loaded in three-point band configuration. So basically, the configuration is the same as the previous one. Uh, so there's uh, two supports and the uh, uh, load, but basically the specimen is smaller and it's used to identify uh, the apparent uh, strength value rather than a true real uh, material property. So how good is the um, consolidation of the lamina in a composite, for example. In a compression testing, uh, you yeah, want to calculate compressive properties like, for example, compression, squashing or crashing. Um, it's conducted to determine the properties under a compressive load uh, on a rectangular beam uh, section. The typical test is the NISO 1426. Now uh, we go to the failure mechanisms of the uh, composites. So we have seen that uh, they might fail in different ways according also to the tensile test or the uh, three-point bending or in the laminar shear or they can fail for other reasons. But let's see why. Uh, one is the delamination. Uh, we uh, mentioned the delamination just a minute ago talking about the interlaminar shear strength. So that can happen uh, that the splitting or tearing between two plies in the plane of a laminate uh, is occurring and uh, this is 
because maybe uh, the consolidation between supplies is not good enough. Uh, a solution for this would be preventing high shear stress in between the plies, and also that's why why one tips of the uh, for the laminate design was to uh, avoid jump in stiffness among the plies. Uh, and this by reducing the external loads or by placing extra layers or use thermoplastics material instead of thermosets. Then buckling. We can see buckling in the picture on the right uh, when yeah, you can see a local buckling mode or a mixed buckling mode. Uh, and in general during compression buckling causes uh, the fibers to be opened uh, or to become misaligned. Uh, thus breaking the bonds uh, between fibers and uh, buckling can happen mostly during the compression test. Then uh, fatigue. Um, this can be caused by the alternating uh, load that are repeated frequently uh, enough on the material. It usually starts at a notch or a crack or a void or uh, just some imperfection of the, uh, of the composite and slowly develops under the influence of varying loads that are maybe repeated uh, frequently enough. So then after that failure occurs uh, after reaching the, the critical length. Uh, here we can see other uh, failure mechanisms that can be caused also from other agents. Can be osmosis for example, uh, so the water absorption uh, from the resin that is a reversible reaction, like for example in polyester that we already say that they are quite uh, highly acroscopic. And this can cause shrinkage uh, or swelling of the composites and this eventually damage the final material. Uh, another can be the UV damage, uh, they can slightly influence uh, the strength and the stiffness of the, of the composite. The erosion that is most related to the surface of the composite and uh, it happens when uh, the, the, the product is uh, in contact with an abrasive medium and uh, eventually temperature, temperature and fire damage. So the resin can be really sensitive to high temperature and fire, like can be for thermoplastics. And also because the temperature, uh, at temperature that are higher than the melting temperature, the resin basically uh, softens or melts again or just can degrade. So can be a solution to apply a fire resistant layer uh, just to protect the resin and protect the composites. Now, um, again, composites lesson is finished. Uh, I hope you found it interesting, uh, it can be helpful for you. Uh, if you have any doubts about composites, please uh, contact infathermoplasticcomposite.nl or just visit our website. And if you are interested about recycling of composites, then see you at the next lecture.